and I'll, I'll be sharing, uh, not today, but uh, in the weeks to come, some of my uh, concerns for the church, and I don't mean just for Rancho Christian Center. Things that God has been speaking to me this year, he has not spoken to me before. It isn't as though he's just reminding me of what he once said, but I believe that he's saying some new things. Not new in the sense that he woke up one morning and realized, I got to do something new. But that it's relevant to the time in which we live. And unfortunately, some of the things that we're going to be encountering in the days to come are cloaked in one thing, but underneath there is something else. And there's a diabolical move afoot to destroy the very fabric of our nation and its value systems. Now you say, Pastor, we've heard that from so many different places. That doesn't come as anything new to my ears. But I think after I have the opportunity to lay some of these things out, I trust that it, it doesn't bring a heaviness, but it brings an awareness. Because the truth is the truth, and it should set us free. But it is warfare. And we have to be aware of what it is that we're battling against. And there is a move afoot to try to reverse things that have been decided in the courts of heaven that man is attempting to redefine. And if we as a church listen to that, not acknowledge it, but listen to it, there's a very strong possibility in the not too distant future the, vo the church will have no voice in the world whatsoever which brings great concern to me because I don't know if that is God's last plan for these last days, then who will he use if it isn't the church? Which even today ties into the day that we're celebrating, and that's Mother's Day. Today is set aside as a day to honor mothers, and I would like the opportunity again if, if we could stay seated, but all the moms would stand, and we just want to acknowledge our appreciation with applause at your loving efforts. Thank you so much for your labor of love and for your concern. We do honor you, and I don't say it as in we'll get it over with and then you get back to your duties because we need our lunches. <laughs> Again, I want to say thank you for giving yourself for us. We bless you today. I personally love Mother's Day because I get a chance to choose to be a blessing by honoring Am I honoring because I had a mom in the natural it was perfect? I knew that wasn't true, not because of her, but because I could look in the mirror and realize she didn't have a perfect son. So it's no reflection on her, obviously, but it's just the statement of the fact that, that we all have things. But God's plan is to remove those things for, from us that we might not have to walk hindered. Again, that song that we sang where there is no way God makes a way. I want to begin in the book of Genesis uh, chapter 1 and verse 27. And I'll tie this together with some of the things that I'll be saying in the next few weeks. Obviously, Bob will be here next week. So I won't be in the pulpit in that manner. Genesis 1.27, I trust, comes as a, as a familiar portion of Scripture to you. I've got several titles for you to choose from, and I know sometimes this drives the sound booth nuts, uh, because one day Elver came into my office and he said, Pastor, now I know I was here last week, and I was listening because I was taking notes, but 
this title doesn't look anything like what you said. And I looked hard to see if, in fact, it was anything that I said, and I couldn't even find it. So <laughs> it either came by revelation to those that faithfully serve in the sound booth or, well, however it came. First title I'd like to introduce is Motherhood, the Role with Many Identities. The second that I'd like to introduce, and I think that they go hand in hand, Mother's Keys to Blessings, or Keys to Blessing. First, Motherhood, the Role with Many Identities, or Mother's Keys to Blessing. In the beginning, when God created them, he created them male and female. And obviously there was Adam, and then out of Adam came Eve. And in Genesis 3.20, it refers to Eve being the mother of all living. And of course, the inference is to mankind. It's always interesting to me when we study those scriptures to realize that woman came out of man. I absolutely believe that nothing was left out when he created woman. Sometimes when I stand in front of the mirror and look at myself as man and then see Viv standing in front of the mirror and seeing how much more perfect she is than I am, I wonder if somewhere along the line when that process happened in the beginning and woman came forth, God looked and said, oh my goodness, not oh my God, but oh my goodness, there was something missing because she came out of man and so this giant hypodermic needle comes out of heaven and you know fills her up with everything that didn't get from him to her. I used to think that women were one of the most emotional creatures on earth, uh, thereby finding how many times men could disqualify them in their character, nature, because you're just really emotional. Until I would look back at that scripture and recognize that woman was taken out of man. So whatever is in woman, if the hypodermic needle didn't come out of heaven, guess what? It's also in man. So uh, she may have even got a double portion, but men, you're just as emotional as women. And, and I realized at that point that it was not to get in touch with my feminine side but to realize the complement of what it was that God would create when he made them male and female was to be a complete unit and not just an add-on or a support as some may feel that the translation indicates. And of course we can read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 where God proclaimed that it was not good for man to be alone and that he would make a helper suitable. I like to believe that that statement there is really a statement of creating a divine helper, sometimes enabler. And depending on the health of a man, Sometimes women find themselves in those unfortunate places of enabling, hoping to make the man different. If I could just pause for a moment and, and go down a, a side trail, not a rabbit trail, to encourage the young ladies that are here today, that at some point you, as you are married, will possibly in, enter into motherhood do not take it from this person up here. Do not look at Mr. Potential and uh, believe that you can change him. Hello? Well, I know he's not perfect, but 
I know that I can change him. You are in line. You're the first in line for a big portion of deception. Because if God hasn't changed him before he got to you, what makes you think if God can't change him that he's going to give the right to you to do it? And some people will go into relationships like that. Well, I know he's got some bad stuff, but I do too. And of course, that's always a statement of humility. And it's a de statement of denial. Everybody knows that we have stuff. I believe God creates women to be divine helpers, not enablers except to encourage men to be all that they can be in God. I have seen situations where godly men have, have chosen women who weren't necessarily of the same persuasion of the place that God ought to play in their lives. And I've actually seen women take godly men down the wrong trail. Because on the other part, the man felt like I could change her. Well, I need you to know that living with one of the most perfect mothers that I know, my wife, uh, I, I recognize that she gave up a long time ago trying to change me not because I was unchangeable, but she knew this very, very, very pertinent thing. If he becomes what I want him to be, and God is not involved, he will become an idol which at some point I will cast aside because that idol will not be able to fulfill all my needs. So I watched and have watched a mother being an instrument of God to help me be what I'm supposed to be in God. But she never started with the notion that well, he's got some rough edges, but I'll be able to take them off. If you are not the sandpaper in God's hand, but you believe you're the sandpaper, you may be sanding in the wrong places at the wrong time. And anybody knows that if you sand something at the wrong time, in the wrong place, it produces an indentation and doesn't make the product look right. Well, I'm getting off this morning. Divine helpers. I believe one of the identities that mothers find themselves in is being divine helpers. And of course, in that same portion of Scripture, Genesis 2.18, refers to Eve as the mother of all living, which translates to me the giver of life. I want to say for a moment, because I know sometimes when we talk about motherhood and fatherhood, if, if there have been some unfortunate relational experiences where you may be concerned with your mother, uh, and so even to think of some of these things you counteract the opportunity to see the positive side of it because of the pain that's involved. Pain is, is real. But one thing that you can't deny is this. She brought you into the world. She brought you into the world. And for that, we should say to God, at the very least, thank you. 
but pastor, you don't understand. No, no. You got to go to the beginning to get all your ducks in a row. If you don't have a, a place to start in putting your ducks in the row, there's no way your ducks will ever line up right because you don't have a starting place. And I'll show you why it's so important. Because sometimes we lose blessings that God has in store for us that we miss because we don't return to give God thanks. I thank God that my mother brought me into the world. I thank God that, that she could have chosen to do otherwise. Even though I'm the oldest male sibling in, in our family and my, my next in line sister passed away from breast cancer when she was 45, which has been a number of years ago. It was only after probably into my early teen years that I found out that I had actually had an older sister who, who died. I think just a couple days after she was born or during that time. And my mom, through what I understood from what others said, was, was just in grief personified and could have very well at that point chosen to give up on having children. I wasn't born into a very affluent family. In fact, it was less than affluent. We would have to have re reached up to fit into the poverty category. But I didn't know any different because I knew my mom loved me giver of life. It's a role sometimes that we lose sight of. Now when I say that, that doesn't excuse anyone from responsibilities and maybe character traits that get exemplified that we think if we really honor them that they're somehow going to say, well, finally, or... <clears throat> You know, you just didn't realize how much I gave for you, and they start an organ recital to make sure that you fully understand how great they are. And I don't say that in a disrespectful way. But I know for me, I want all the blessings that God has for me, not just for my personal consumption, but that I may turn around and be a blessing to someone else. The Bible says, in Jesus' own words, He says, you shall not see me until you are willing to say, blessed is He, and it can be in parentheses, she, he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you don't have to go very far into the beginning of the story back in the book of Genesis when I referred to Genesis 1, and 28, that God created woman in His image. And so it would stand to reason that if the initial creation is a representation of God, and when you bless God, when you honor God, there's things that come with that blessing and that honor that you can't find any other way, I try to be somewhat intelligent and realize that I don't want to miss any blessing. Even though in the course of appreciating that blessing, it may have been salted along the way with painful experiences. Do you know that unforgiveness does not bind the person that you have unforgiveness toward? Unforgiveness binds you. In fact, in some way, they may be even more free because you're so busy. I, I'm just saying generically, people are so busy blaming them. 
motherhood, the role with many identities, divine helper, giver of life. This is one that I just kind of like to laugh about a little bit, but I'd like you, if you can, to turn with me there. It's in the book of Judges. What an unusual place to be looking for a testimony of motherhood. It's probably one of the most profound in the Old Testament, one of the most profound stories with regard to the issue of motherhood. So if you could turn there for a few moments, I would like us to walk through some references here that I hope will be of great encouragement to mothers that God hasn't left you out in the divine economy of all that he intends to do in the world then, now, and in the future. Judges chapter 4 begins the story about a a woman by the name of Deborah. I don't know how many of you know what Deborah means. Honeybee. Deborah means honeybee. Well, I recognized when I was reading this again this morning and just sort of chuckling inside, there's one characteristic of a honeybee that I know that is fairly prominent among all honeybees. They have a sting. (laughs) And so when you make reference honey, in fact, that is is one of the most um, profound words in the language of most other nations, and especially in the African community because they don't have a word that translates honey in reference to a person. And when I would say to them, and I would say to my wife, Vivian, honey, the place would just break into laughter (laughs) because the translator stood there dumbfounded because he didn't know how to explain honey when you're referring to someone else. I guess I should have taken them to the book of Judges. Well, Pastor, how does that work with regard to the motherhood issue and the role of many identities? Because I discovered over the years that mothers have a sting like nobody else. But it is never to wound, even though at times there may be wounding. But in God's economy of things, it was never his intention. It was basically to get our intention our attention. Honeybee. Husbands, if you're sitting next to your wives, say, honey, you're also my little bee. And I do and am familiar with your sting, but sting on because there's things that I need to be aware of. Why did I say that this is one of the most profound references in the Old Testament to the issue of motherhood? Because you don't have to look very far in the chapter there to discover that this woman, Deborah, was also a prophetess, verse 4, and she was a wife, and she was also judging Israel at that time. I think that's a lot on her plate. And in verse 5, it refers to the children of Israel coming up to her for judgment. Ladies, I believe that you are essential, essential to the victory of the church in these later hours. And I want to say, if you feel in any way that any part of the administration of this church has dishonored you, please call me. Because I believe, and I will just leap ahead for just a moment to some things that I'll be sharing in the days to come. I believe the whole thing that is is in front of the Supreme Court right now with regard to marriage as a smokescreen. It's much more diabolical than anybody could ever have dreamed. Now, some of you who may campaign for this, 
and be persuaded that there are some larger issues involved in this. I want you to know that the campaign in the powers of darkness has nothing to do with same-sex marriage. Ultimately, part of this is to destroy the identity of mothers. And to make mothers nothing more than birthplaces, instruments. We are fooling around with one of seven of God's major covenants. And if we as the church allow, allow marriage to be redefined, we are basically saying to God, you better go back and review what you said about the male and female because we think it's wrong. God, please help us. I believe, women, you are key to the survival of the church. I think this is one of the portions of Scripture, men, that we should read and understand and ask God revelation for because it's part of what the enemy has worked long and hard. The smokescreen that gets created is even through the course of women having to find their place in society, women's suffrage and all that we can see historically. And we think that it's just women clamoring for equal rights. I'm not suggesting that there may not be some of that. But in God's economy of things, it was never an issue. From the beginning, they were created equal. And I think it's the church who's going to stand up and say, wait a minute, we're not redefining anything here. We believe if God says what it is, then we believe God. Even though we have friends, we believe God. Mothers, we want to honor you today for the stuff that you've had to put up with, part of which has come through the hand of the church. Is it all right if I bear my soul a little bit, or would that scare someone that the pastor might have had some weaknesses in the past? Some of you who were asleep just woke up, said, man, this is stuff I need to hear. There was a time in the course of, of the church here, as God began to lean on me concerning some of my own maleness. Not manliness, but maleness. You know there's a difference? You can be a male and not be a man. And it's not just your anatomy. But I realized that I had some maleness that was showing itself. And as God began to speak to me about restoring the restoration of all things according to Acts chapter 3, is this of benefit to anyone? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 3 verses 19 through 21 actually says that heaven's holding on to Jesus until the restoration of all things. And before you are persuaded that that's a walk down the tulip lane out into a field flowing with milk and honey, you might as well just get rid of that and get on the real road. Because the restoration of all things goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, not to the beginning of the New Testament. He wants to restore all things. And so as I was beginning even to share with Viv that uh, I really believe that God's showing me some things concerning women. And she said, well, really, it's got to start with you because you, you have a problem with women. Well, 
I just thought, first thing I need to do is deliver her because she's obviously deceived because I'm married to one. She said, well, that's kind of part of the problem because you're fine with me, but if anybody else comes around and wants to say anything, then you get sort of your hairs on your neck stand up. They won't stand up as much because they got a haircut, but but she said, you have a problem with women. And, and I just, no, I, I don't have a problem with women. And then I kind of got one of those heavenly visions of God sitting on the throne doing this. You know, he doesn't have to speak. All he has to do is move his head. You know, like we read in the book of Psalms, when it says that he will guide you with the eye, doesn't even have to speak. And it took me a while. Men, I want to give you some hope here. First of all, don't counteract when God is speaking to you in that way by saying, leave me alone, I'm fine just the way I am because I can rest assured, I can give you assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. He does not subscribe to the notion that you're fine. He loves you the way you are, but he's not going to leave you that way. Because hopefully you're wanting to be in his image, which means that at that point you're going to be a representative for him, and he does... He does care about how people represent him. And I wasn't representing very well. Over the course of the years, God began to change me. And now I realize we can't go, we, we, we can't get down the road to victory if in any way the identity of women is tampered with. Hence motherhood. So even though you may have had some bad experiences personally, stop. Stop. And say, God, first and foremost, you are the giver of all life. And through my mom, you gave me life. And right now, I want to break the back of hell operating in any part of my sphere and I forgive once and for all. One of the characteristics or the roles of womanhood is being fearless. Fearless. Say, Pastor, I'm, I'm married to a mother, and, and man, she's afraid of everything. She's always telling me, man, I'm so afraid. Be careful about your labeling, because it's an idiot who confesses he has no fear. How do you know that, Pastor? Because how many times did God have to speak to men who were leading even the children of Israel into places, and the first thing he says to them, you remember what it is? Don't be afraid. When the angel came to Joseph and Mary on different occasions, and I believe at some point together, what was one of the first things that the angel said, fear not, don't be afraid. The presence of fear is not the absence of faith. Our responsibility as men is to learn how to see what it is that they are seeing so that if there is a spiritual element to it, we do battle against that and that we become a stability in their life that does away with the natural fears. But to suggest for a moment that we're ever going to be without, with, 
that, that we're going to be absence, uh, absent of the presence of fear is, is delirious thinking. We won't be delivered from fear until we're dead. Because even the most committed Christian will still fear death itself. Even though they have salvation. Judges chapter 4 verses 8 and 9. Barak who was at that time one of the figures in Israel that was supposed to be leading recognized the place that Deborah the honeybee was going to play in the history of the deliverance of the people at that time and and so he carefully articulated that I'm not going to go anywhere unless you go with me. One of this one of the things that this says to me, and I think it's borne out as we look at Luke chapter 2, which I'm not going to take time to go to today. <clears throat> Women have a sensitivity in the spiritual realm that is light years ahead of what men have. Hello? Hello? I, I would have preferred had it been a male element that would have said that, but I'll take what I can get. Josh, can you come up, please? Mothers, ladies, I want to honor you in putting up with our spiritual nonsense when you say something to us and all we can see is an opportunity to react because you bring something to our attention that we haven't seen. I've learned because she was created as the divine helper and divine enabler that when I give her honor, blessings come from heaven when I give her honor, revelations come from heaven. When I give her honor, I begin to be put in a place in her life that I couldn't fight for. Over the last 50 years almost now of our time together, I know it's hard to understand, Al, the fact that we're only 55, so. <laughs> but all the years that we have enjoyed together are growing even deeper and greater. Because I've come to realize how much voice of God sounds like Vivian's voice. Probably one of the major things we deal with in young and old alike in marriage situations when they come in to talk to us is usually preceded by the husband opening his mouth and revealing his ignorance. My wife says we need some help, but I just don't know what she's talking about. The fact is that if she'd get off my back, everything would be all right. I don't rebuke them, I just smile. Because I was there. It's the first positional identity that God gave 
that the man could not fulfill. Be fruitful and what? Boys, you, you can't do that without women. I have yet to find a guy in the Bible that gave birth to a child, naturally. Increase comes when you honor. I've heard the jokes, and probably some of those came out of my lips. I'm the head of my house. And then you hear this echo. Yeah, but there's the neck that turns the head. Ha ha. You ever realize your neck is actually connected to your body, even if your neck is part of the process to get your head to turn? So you can't treat it like it doesn't belong. And sometimes I get a crick in my neck that makes my head turn because my head is facing the wrong direction and won't change unless there's a pain to make it change. Ladies, moms, I honor you for putting up with our nonsense. I'd like to ask you to just be patient with us, but I feel like that's just a little bit too much license. I'd rather say it this way, keep being used by the hand of God until we look more like Jesus than ourselves. Now the only person that really can give your wife permission to do that for those of us that are married is you. But I'm telling you something, God has put all of his proverbial marbles in one basket in these last days. His hope is in the church. Well, you know what I realized? My hope to be all that I could ever be in God sits right here in this chair. And when I give honor there, I don't find myself being depressed or oppressed. I find that she gives every opportunity to lift me up. Rightfully spoken, I feel like in her life I'm on a pedestal. And that's not my words. Those are her words. Now at times the pedestal needs to be knocked over so I fall down and realize that I really not am as high as I thought I was. But she'll write the pedestal and put me back there. Men, there's no feeling like that in the world. Being the greatest marksman, accomplishing big things, building corporations that touch nations, standing in front of thousands of people and preaching the Word of God and hearing the accolades pales in comparison to the words that come that say, I can't live without you. You are the most important thing in my life, not as in a possession, but as in key to my existence. Those words I treasure. Those words are life. Because she's a giver of life. Ladies, we honor you. Could I ask you to stand one last time, moms, if you'd just stand. I want to pray a blessing over you. 
the pains that you have experienced even in the birth process. Sometimes in those moments of transition, there may come some confusion about, is this really what I was hoping for? But then when the child comes, you realize, yes, the pain was worth it. Moms, thank you for putting up with us as we grow up and hopefully grow into what we're supposed to be. Moms, don't stop being the stinging bee. Don't stop bringing the things to us that we need to hear, even when it appears that we're resistant to that. We can't live without you. So, Father, I pray a blessing. And men, be wise right now for you just to extend your hands in whatever direction you can towards the lady, be it your wife or someone else. And you, along with me, make it a corporate blessing. We bless the mothers here today. And Jesus, because you are the kinsman redeemer, you are the healer. I ask, Lord, where there are pockets of pain. May I should say, as there are pockets of pain. I'm asking right now, Lord Jesus, that you go yourself. You go yourself right now. And extend your heart and hands to them and say, let me have your pain. I want you to be healed and I will heal you and I will restore your hope for I have not left you alone says the Lord I have not cast you aside from my divine plan for I will cause you to be spokespersons in my kingdom and even in the kingdoms of the world. And you will be my representation. And I will walk with you through every circumstance. And I will bring you into the fullness of all that I've created you for. Now be at peace, my daughters. For I love you with an everlasting love. And I bless you today. Give. Give what I have given you even this day. And I will give you more. Lord, we just agree with your proclamations this morning over our ladies here. These are the greatest ladies in the world. The greatest ladies in the world. And we honor them and we say thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God, God wants to extend all of his goodness to you today. So just receive it and have a wonderful Mother's Day today. And uh, just... God bless you.